Hi all, happy Monday, welcome to The Wife of Caesar. My name is Michel Levien, or Michel Levien, either is fine. As you know, The Wife of Caesar is Steiner's project to talk about corruption or anti-corruption using, using regular words so that we can fight corruption in our day-to-day -day lives with a little bit more than just good intentions. Okay, as usual, we will have a piece of news, a case, and a typology. Today's news has to deal with Pemex once again. Today, there is a bit of nuance. It involves another company, but still Pemex. For those of you who don't remember, Pemex is the Mexican state-owned oil company. It is a company owned by the government, and they are in the business of extracting oil and transforming it for fuel. Okay, um, the, the news today is that Pemex has been involved in several corruption scandals. No serious indictments have been brought ever against Pemex or against its high officials, but it's it's... It's, Pemex has been in the news concerning corruption pretty much permanently for the last maybe 10 years. And today, um, today's news comes, from, comes to us from the Wall Street Journal, where a special report documents um, illegal activities within Pemex and how a, an Israeli intelligence espionage firm obtained recordings uh, of a Pemex high official admitting that contracts are actually sold uh, for bribes within the company and how a particular company was targeted because it didn't have any money to presumably pay those bribes. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Um, Oro Negro is a company, a Mexican energy company. And again, it is also in the business of extraction uh, uh, of oil. They are in the drilling business, and it, it is a firm, a relatively young firm that was created with the purpose of purchasing equipment for drilling and extraction of oil and executing uh, the, the drilling and providing those services for Pemex in exchange for a fee. Now, as of 2014, where we had a, a worldwide decrease in the, in the prices of oil, Pemex was forced to reduce the fees that it paid to its contractors. Uh, however, it was rumored or actually very well documented that the fees that Pemex was paying Oro Negro were lower than the fees that it was paying everyone else, even after the reduction in fees. And Oro Negro claims that, or the officials at Oro Negro claim that this was because uh, they refused to pay bribes and, and so Pemex uh, was punishing it for not paying bribes. So what happened here is that the company reached out to Black Cube, an Israeli security and intelligence firm. Again, security and intelligence are just fancy speak for espionage, private espionage. And they commissioned Black Cube with obtaining recordings and documenting the corrupt practices of Pemex. So two operatives from Black Cube approached an official from Pemex and they claimed to be representatives of uh, an investor from the United Arab Emirates and which investor was interested in buying Oro Negro, but they were only interested in buying Oro Negro if they could receive assurances from this Pemex official that Oro Negro would continue to receive uh, contracts for, from Pemex. And the official was very much on record, recorded as saying that that, that shouldn't be a problem, that m most officials in Pemex, and this is a widespread practice, uh, simply accept bribes through what they call operatives or relatives, sometimes sons, daughters, uh, family members, friends. And as long as they could pay those bribes, then uh, this official could ensure that Oro Negro would continue to receive contracts. And when the officials, uh, sorry, when the, the operatives, the black cube operatives or spies asked this official why Oro Negro had received unfavorable treatment, uh, the official simply replied with, well, it, it's a financial issue. They essentially don't have money, presumably for bribes. In addition to this, Oro Negro is incorporated or created um, or structured as what we call an investment promotion corporation. It's a regular corporation that has the ability of receiving investment from the public without having to become listed in a public stock exchange. So it's sort of um, one stepping stone between being a regular corporation and being a publicly traded corporation. 
uh, where you can get investment from the public to grow, but you don't have to meet all of the requirements uh, of a public company. Okay, this is important because the the investors that invested in Oro Negro um, were, well, largely the public, but some of the company's opponents were actually invested in the company. They buy stock in the company and this entitles them to several things, among which, among which is receiving financial information and having the ability to bring claims or to bring suits against um, the management. So essentially you buy one or two shares of stock or a few shares of stock in the company and you immediately gain rights over the management of the company. And these investors allegedly pressured Oro Negro and its managed management uh, both from the inside and from the outside by uh, colluding with the Pemex uh, officials to reduce the fees that Oro Negro was gaining. So on the one hand, they were pressuring uh, or their friends in Pemex were pressuring or Oro Negro by lowering the fee, their fees, so essentially cutting down profits. And the same people from the inside were pressuring the management of Oro Negro uh, because they weren't making enough money. Presumably, this is what led the company to go bankrupt and essentially file, yeah, file for, for bankruptcy. Again, this sounds like this company is being the victim, but there are indictments uh, currently against the management uh, of Oro Negro. And these indictments were brought because the, the managers allegedly um, embezzled several million dollars from the company. And these, these uh, accusations were brought again by investors. And these have, they, they have not been put to rest or they have not been successfully concluded. So does this mean that the people at Oro Negro are, are wholly in innocent? No, but also it doesn't mean that the people in Pemex or in the Mexican government are entirely right. As most as in most cases, the truth probably lies somewhere in between, but to, to date, we don't know what it is yet. Of course, we will keep you posted. Okay, let's move on to the case. As you know, Transparency International turns 25 this year and they released a list of the 25 most iconic cases in corruption and we are doing a rundown of that list. So today is the case of the Panama Papers. Panama Papers was a very, very large scandal involving um, a law firm from Panama and several issues with money laundering, offshore investments and um, shell companies. Okay. Background. There was this firm, uh, no longer exists, in Panama, Panama City, called uh, Mossack Fonseca, and they were in the business of incorporating businesses. So essentially helping clients create companies. There's nothing essentially wrong with that, but he here's the kick. They were helping clients set up uh, shell companies that no one can tra could trace back to them. Now, you know that in most jurisdictions, in most countries, there has to be an official record of who owns companies, but this isn't the case in Panama. Panama has what we know as bearer bonds or bearer stocks. That means that you can create a company and issue the stock of a company, the pieces of paper that have incorporated in them the rights of the shares of stock. And those pieces of paper don't have to have a name on them. The owner is the person who uh, literally holds the, the uh, the, piece, the piece of paper or who bears it. This is why we call them bearer stocks. Okay, so this makes it very difficult to track down. You have a company and that company can do business, but it makes it very difficult to track down who the real owners of a company are. And this facilitates uh, act, cor acts of corruption because I might be a public official in, in one country and I incorporate this, this country under the, the financial secrecy veil of the uh, laws of Panama. And then I, I do business with my own company and nobody knows that it is my company. This is um, what's known as banking or financial secrecy. Essentially the notion that the law uh, protects your financial operations and precludes anyone else from knowing uh, who is doing what. This was very useful several years ago, but today it has been abused and used mainly for illicit purposes. And it has been largely outlawed uh, around the world, except in a few countries like Panama. Now, 
again, this firm was in the business of creating other firms, helping these bad, bad people create shell companies. And they kept records of who they, who their clients were and what companies they incorporated. So essentially, um, the authorities, the law, enfor law enforcement would have, uh, if they were tracking down one of these companies, they would run into a dead end um, when they came across the, the Panamanian companies because they could not know who was behind them. Well, this provided, provided them with the missing link between the, the Panamanian companies and the people who actually owned them. And essentially what happened was that several files uh, several hard drives from uh, Mossack Fonseca were leaked to the public and these drives explain or these files explain who owned what. Now, these files documented that the law firm create, incorporated around over 200,000 shell companies, uh, again, under the structure of bearer stock, anonymous shell companies. Among the owners of these companies were a little bit over 140 politicians of these politicians, politicians from around the world. Of these politicians, 12 were heads of state. So the highest official in a country, president, prime minister, and so on and so forth. This led to several resignations by these officials. They, they essentially, the public figured out what they were doing and they were so embarrassed that they were forced to resign. Not all of them. Among these people were 33 sanctioned individuals. And when we say sanctioned individuals, we, we mean that other countries or other international organizations have put them on a black list of money laundering, grand corruption, terrorism, all the good stuff. And they were, again, uh, being helped by this law firm to do business uh, under the guise of shell companies. The scandal led to investigations in 82 countries and several of these countries who uh, were still using financial secrecy, they uh, made serious commitments to end it and some of them actually reformed their laws and changed, changed them to reflect this. 16 countries and international organizations like banking organizations and such underwent serious reform to ensure that something like this could not happen again. Uh, still, Panama ha has their same uh, legal legal regime, but this did change a lot because these countries and these organizations decided not to do business with shell companies or at least to make it harder for people to incorporate these ghost or shell companies. Finally, the result was these people were not all criminals. However, they were using financial secrecy to hide financial operations. And one of the reasons to hide financial operations is because you don't want your government to know how much money you, you, are, you are moving or you are controlling because you don't want to pay taxes. As a result of the Panama Papers, 23 countries were able to recover taxes from people who were otherwise uh, evading them or avoiding uh, taxation, and they were able to recover around $1.2 billion in taxes. So it wasn't all bad news. The Panama Papers are still out there and they are still feeding investigations. However, not everyone has access to it. Only a few people who have been vetted and are considered trustworthy have access to the papers and they probably will still, will still yield results for maybe the coming decade. Coolio, let's move on to the typology. Today we get to talk about slush funds or sometimes called reptile funds. It's so rare that we get to talk about things that have such a cool name. Okay, so slush funds or reptile funds are bags of money that you use to commit bad acts. Let's back up a little bit and give you a little, let me give you a little bit of background. Now, Otto von Bismarck in the end of the, in the, end of the 19th century was involved in a very large war be between the um, Austrian-Hungarian Empire and Prussia in which he, of which he emerged a victor. Now, several of his opponents had to flee the country as a result of the war, and they left behind large sums of money. And instead of simply appropriating those funds for the government, he decided to do something different. He decided to take that money and put it in a special fund, still owned by the government, but only controlled by a few select people and destined for a very specific purpose. He wanted to use that money to improve the public perception of his government and his country, both 
within uh, within the country and outside the country. So he used this money to create a sovereign fund that would, would be destined only for propaganda. Again, with the local or the national media and the foreign media as well. He claimed very famously that he would use this money to chase down those reptiles back to their caves. Now, the, the notion stuck because, you know, it's a very harsh word. And the idea uh, behind reptiles was sort of shifted. And instead of identifying the people that originally owned the money, it came to be no, it came to be used to identify the media to a degree. Now, these funds, because of the way they were structured, they, they figured out that this strategy was very useful. You have by fiat or by a decree, you create a fund that only you can control and that is entirely secret and that you can use to your own political convenience. So very naturally, these funds, uh, this money began to be used for other illicit activities, essentially paying bribes. And it's not uncommon to have slush funds to use to pay bribes to buy political will or political votes or essentially tra any type of trafficking in influence. The model became so popular that now uh, slush funds are used for illicit activity in general. And one of the most, the more famous examples of, of slush funds were the funds that President Nixon was using in the 70s, um, in the 60s and 70s to buy political will and pay uh, political bribes. This led, of course, to the Watergate scandal and a major change in global legislation concerning corruption. Okay, so that was it for today. We leave you, as usual, with this. Every act of corruption should be denounced. Please blow the whistle, but do so safely. If you're not sure if you're witnessing corruption or you're not sure that you're safe, don't do anything. Reach out to people who might help you. Feel free to reach out to us at info at strina.mx and we will be glad to help you. But above all, please stay safe. Again, this has been The Wife of Caesar. My name is Michelle Levien or Michelle Levien. Either is fine. And you have a happy Monday.